Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, and this week I have a tidbit about why we say something has gone by the wayside, and a meaty middle about movies we call biopics, or are they biopics? Let's start with the tidbit. Have you ever missed a deadline or failed a test? You may have planned to prepare, but then something happened and those plans fell by the wayside. But what is the wayside, anyway? And does it hurt if you fall by it? Let's find out. We'll start with the word way. A way is a road or a path, as in highway, byway, or the phrase going my way. You've probably said that before. The wayside, therefore, is the land on either side of the way, what we might call the roadside. The term wayside can first be found in the Middle English poem, Morte Arthur. This poem was written in the 1400s by an unknown author. It tells part of the legend of King Arthur. It's sometimes called the alliterative Morte Arthur because it uses so much alliteration, many words that start with the same sound. At one point in the story, Arthur's knights are traveling around France when they find themselves ambushed. They're attacked, the poet writes, by, quote, 50,000 des of folke of ferse men of armes, who appear on the way sidus of a beckon wode. In other words, 50,000 armed men sneak through a beechwood forest, appear on the side of the road, and attack. And to anyone who's proficient in Old English, I apologize if I messed up those pronunciations. I, I did the best I could. These days, we often hear wayside used in the phrase to fall by the wayside. That means to forget about something or neglect it. For example, you might say your grass died because your watering fell by the wayside. Or that your plans to save money fell by the wayside when you saw that sweet pair of Jordans. So that's your tidbit for today. The wayside is the side of the road, and if something falls there, it's been forgotten about or neglected. That segment was written by Samantha Enslin, who runs Dragonfly Editorial. You can find her at dragonflyeditorial.com or on Twitter as dragonflyedit. Before we get to the meaty middle, it's time to tell you about this week's sponsor, Audible. Do you love books but find that you never have time to read them? Well, Audible has the perfect solution. Get audiobooks so you can listen to those books you've been meaning to read while you're on the go, at the gym, or during your commute. Audible.com has audiobooks from the leading audiobook publishers, broadcasters, entertainers, magazine and newspaper publishers, and business information providers. Their app is free and works on iPhones, iPad, Android, and Windows phones. You can also download and listen on your Kindle Fire and more than 500 MP3 players. And unlike a streaming or rental service, with Audible you own your books. So you can access your books anytime and anywhere, right from your smartphone. This week I started listening to Austin Land, an audiobook about a young New York woman who can't find love because no real man can overcome her obsession with Jane Austen's Mr. Darcy. I missed the movie when it came out a few years ago, so when I saw Austin Land on sale at Audible, I happily gave it a try. And just for listeners, Audible.com is offering a free 30-day trial membership. So you could start listening to Austin Land or almost any other audiobook free today. Go to audible.com slash gg today to start your free trial. Again, show your support for Grammar Girl and get a free 30-day trial at audible.com slash gg. And now on to another type of movie, movies about real people. We'll start by talking about misles. What's a misal, you ask? It's a pronunciation of a word based on its spelling. It gets its name from the past tense of the verb mislead. The word misled can be misread as misled. People who read it this way may go for years before they realize that misled and misled are the same word the same way it took me to realize that Tucson and Tucson, Arizona, were the same place. Other misals include infrared for infrared and warp lanes for warplanes. I'll link to a further list of misals in the transcript at quickanddirtytips.com. 
However, the misal I want to talk about today is a word for a movie based on the life of a real person, such as Amadeus, the imitation game, or the theory of everything. The word was coined in the 1940s by shortening the words biographical and picture to bio and pic, and then forming a compound word out of these clipped forms, biopic. The misal for biopic is biopic. This misal is particularly strong because when we see IC at the end of a word, it's usually a suffix. The temptation to put the stress on the OP syllable is even stronger in biopic because so many other words end not just in IC, but in OPIC, as in topic, tropic, and myopic. Some of them are medical and scientific words that contain the root scope, such as telescopic, microscopic, and arthroscopic. Even though OPIC isn't a suffix in any of these words, it's still easy to notice a pattern. It doesn't help that people don't call movies pictures or pics anymore, either. They call them movies or films. So there's plenty of reason to assume that biopic is pronounced biopic. Usually, when people learn the word's etymology, they quickly revise their pronunciation. Sometimes they're embarrassed by their earlier pronunciation. But here's an interesting question. Why are speakers so ready to change their pronunciation? Why is it so obvious that if a word is composed of bio and pic, it should be pronounced biopic? How do we know that biopic is like biosphere, biomass, and biotechnology, and not like biology, biography, and antibiotic? The answer involves two of the many roles that English speakers know without knowing they know them. The first rule is about suffixes. We know that only certain suffixes, including IC, insist on coming right after a stressed syllable. For example, when you put IC on the root thorax, you get thoracic, not thoracic. The verb terrify has stress on the first syllable, terrify but the adjective terrific has stress right before the IC. We don't say terrific. In contrast, other suffixes, such as F-U-L, full, don't mess with the stress of their root words. When we attach full to the noun wonder, we get wonderful, not wonderful. So when we learn that the IC at the end of biopic isn't a suffix at all, much less one that needs a stressed syllable before it, we're immediately less likely to put the stress on the op, O-P. And when we learn that biopic is a compound, the second rule comes into play, the rule of compound stress. English speakers know that English compound words are almost always stressed on their first element. We have web pages, not web pages. Airports, not airports. Hot dogs, not hot dogs, at least not if we're talking about sausages. If the first element has more than one syllable, the stress still doesn't get shifted anywhere. So we say parking lot, not parking lot, and monkey bars, not monkey bars, and apartment building, not apartment building. Using the compound stress rule, the word is pronounced biopic, not biopic. Still in all, the misal biopic may be gaining more legitimacy than misals such as infrared, warplanes, and misled. Earlier, I asked why speakers were so willing to change their pronunciation when they learned the etymology of biopic. But the truth is that not all of them do. To some, Biopic just sounds right, regardless of how it was created. I found several online threads discussing the pronunciation of biopic, and there is always someone to defend the biopic pronunciation, even if they know the word is composed of bio and pick. Furthermore, the online Cambridge Dictionary has recordings of both pronunciations, and it says that biopic is actually the UK pronunciation, while biopic is the American one. 
So if you've been saying biopic all this time and the thought of changing is disturbing you, don't worry about it too much. As long as you're not saying biopic, you should be fine. That segment was written by Neil Whitman, an independent researcher and writer on language and grammar. He blogs at literalminded.wordpress.com and tweets at literalminded. And I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl. The ebook version of my book, The Grammar Devotional, is on sale right now for just $1.99. So if you've ever wanted to check out one of my books, now is a great time. Search any online bookstore for The Grammar Devotional. Finally, if you're heading to the NCTE meeting or Council on English Leadership in Atlanta, come by and say hello. I'm speaking at the CEL lunch on Sunday and doing a book signing right afterward, and I'd love to meet you. That's all. Thanks for listening.